the first thing you might notice about us is there's quite a few of us on stage at the moment. So just before we really get into things, a couple of quick introductions. I'm Chris, and I'm studying first year marketing here at Lancaster. I'm Catherine, I'm studying an MSc in Sustainable Agriculture and Food Security. Hi, I'm Hazel, and like Catherine, I'm doing an <coughs> MSc in Sustainable Agriculture and Food Security. And I'm Tasha, and I'm also doing my MSc in Environmental Science and Technology, and together we community roots. So we got started back in May of this year when we were representing Lancaster U at the Global Tour for Food Challenge. And in this, we were trying to come up with different ways and different ideas to end world hunger, so to speak. Unfortunately, we didn't make it to the second round of the challenge, but that's okay. We're still here and we're still trying to get people active in this fight against hunger because it's such a serious issue. So I grew up in the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago, very tiny islands, and we're still a developing nation. So it was quite common for me that when I go out into the cities, you'd see a lot of hungry people, and they would come up and they would ask you for money to be able to buy some food. I think this was my first experience seeing what it's like for people to be without food. Also, I remember growing up, I was seven or eight, I used to watch a lot of telly, and there would be these sponsor a child in Africa ads on TV. And I was, I was too young to be able to actually pick up the phone and donate money. So what I did instead was that my mom had, she had given me a little black purse that I used to keep in my closet. And every time I got an allowance, I would put money in it. And on a note, I wrote a little note saying, this goes to UNICEF. Because I'm sure if you, many of you can relate, one of the things that I don't like to see is a child being hungry. So speaking of that, I'm sure many of you have seen a picture similar to this before, yeah? It's quite a sad picture, but it's reality. This shows a, local, a child at a local clinic in Kenya, and he's being screened for malnutrition. But like I said, this happens all around the world, and this is how some people live every single day. In fact, since I've started speaking to you, I would say over 120 persons have just died from hunger or hunger-related disease. Food security. So one of the most pressing challenges that we face in this century. It's estimated we have 925 million people living in hunger. That's almost 1 billion on a planet of 7 billion. To break this down even further, that's one in every eight persons being hungry. We still have a further 1 billion living in malnutrition. I know those are a lot of numbers to take in. But hunger on an everyday basis kills more people than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. So I just mentioned that we have 7 billion people on our planet currently, but we're set to increase to over 9 billion by 2050. That's not a long time away. And the majority of these hungry people, they live in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia and the Pacific. So what does this mean? What I just showed you on these slides, it means that very soon we're going to have a lot more mouths to feed, particularly in the lesser developed areas. Unfortunately, the challenge doesn't stop there. We're going to go through what is called the perfect storm. There's going to be an increased demand for food, water, and energy. These are going to send food prices skyrocketing. We have 3 billion people living under US $2 per day currently. So can you imagine what is going to happen when food prices go up? A lot more people are going to be pushed into hunger. So what else drives us to hunger? Well, for one, there's our changing consumption patterns, especially for people who can afford more food. Simply put, we're eating too much. The Global Footprint Network estimates at the current rate that we're eating at, we're going to need two Earths to support us by 2030. We don't have that, so we need to make it work right now on what we've got. Fitting in with this is the fact that we're eating a lot more livestock products than before. Did you know right here in the UK, we eat more chicken than we ever have? And what's even more shocking is that over a third of the world's grain supply doesn't filter down towards feeding our population, no. It goes towards feeding the animals that we eat in the future. So I just spoke to you about some of the social issues that affect us from being able to provide food security. There's a lot more to this though. There's a lot of environmental issues as well. And all of these we need to work on together to be able to have a fighting and a proper chance to feed our future population. Thank you. Okay, so to meet these increasing demands for food by the general public and these growing consumption patterns, we need to intensify, inten intensify the yield potential of our land. So previously to do this, 
We've increased our usage of fertilizers, pesticides, and we've used our on-land water resources as a source of irrigation. Now, alongside these and technical technological advances, we've greatly increased our yield, and we've been able to feed the world a lot more than previously. But we've become to realize in recent years we haven't been doing this sustainably. Let me just show you this photo. This is the Aral Sea in Kazakhstan. And you can see on the left-hand side, in 1989, this was one of the four largest water bodies in the world. But now look at the right-hand side. In 2008, it's just 10% of what it used to be. And this is purely due to irrigation. We've been trying to irrigate the desert land, which is just not suitable for agriculture. Now let's have a look at fertilizers. Look at this graph. There's a really strong correlation between adding fertilizers to your land and increasing yields, which is great, and all the farmers know this. But there is a point at which adding more fertilizer won't increase your yield, as you can see from the curvature of the line. So a study has shown recently that China could reduce their nitrogen fertilizer input by 60%. Now, this is a huge number. And in terms of what it means globally, we could be reducing our environmental, like greenhouse gas emissions which, as you know, I'm sure contribute to ozone depletion and consequently climate change. Now, I know you've all heard of climate change, but you guys, and speaking generally, might think of it as I was doing a year ago in terms of, oh, are we going to get a nice summer this year, lots of sun, am I going to be able to get tan? But what we should be thinking about is, from a farmer's perspective, are they going to get any crop yield this year? The climate is like, significantly unpredictable at the moment. So what are we going to do? If you think back to March in the UK this year, the mean temperature was just 2.2 degrees. And this is 3.3 degrees below the average from 1981 to 2010, making it the coldest March since 1962. As a consequence of this, we've had an extended winter. Now, here's an interesting fact. In June, this statistic came out, that Britain's wheat yields this year could be 30% smaller than they have been last year. But last year, they were smaller than the previous year. This could mean, like, for later on this year, prices will increase in all wheat-based products. But this isn't just a UK thing, this is global. Have a look at this photo of some farmland in North Dakota in the USA. You can see it's completely flooded. What we should be seeing at this time, it was taken in May, is crops coming to the middle of their season. So we've got all these environmental problems now, and I've just mentioned a few. And we've got 7 billion people to feed, and 1 billion are starving. So in 2050, when we've got 9 billion, what are we going to do? Okay, if a state of food security is going to be attained, we need to fulfill four basic criteria. These are availability, accessibility, utilisation and stability. Now, in order to attain these conditions, we need to, um, it's going to take a broad spectrum of multidisciplines working together. If you look at this diagram here, we can see what those are. They are science and technology, industry, global trade, politics, consumers and farmers. And if you look at the bottom of the chart, we can see that there's a balance as it stands to reason that as the population increases, so must the amount of food that we produce. But what we also know is the amount of land available for cultivation cannot be extended as this will further amplify the effects of climate change. So what we need to do is achieve maximum productivity from existing cultivated land. One of the ways we can do this is through water use efficiency in crop plants. Now, this is a big area of research here at Lancaster. Woo! It's, it's very exciting because I'm a bit of a plant geek, but basically, we need to maintain or improve crop yields by using less water. Um, and we can also do that through um, novel irrigation techniques or, for example, plant breeding, where um, Water use efficient genes are introduced through conventional breeding or we can use biotechnology methods and um, use genetic modifications to achieve this. 
And that's quite a useful tool, as we can also introduce plants that are designed to grow on water or nutrient-deficient soils under extreme temperatures. This is relevant in Africa, for example, where there is a water shortage and there's also a nitrogen depletion. But farmers have to play their role too to implement the science and technology and induce agricultural reform and sustainably intensify agriculture. So they can do that through soil management practices or through um, cultural techniques such as crop rotation. But it all needs to be done in a sustainable fashion in order to continue to produce food. Now, in addition to all this, politics need to play their role and improve infrastructure and distribution efficiency to reach rural communities that can then access trade routes. But as going back to the diagram that we saw earlier, it's important that consumers understand their role in all this too. So we've put together a few tips of what you can do to take control of your own food security. Um, you can reduce waste by not buying more than what you need and eating what you do buy. You can shop ethically by buying fair trade where possible, ensuring that farmers get a fair price for the produce. You can buy less meat. Um, as Tasha mentioned, this will involve less grains going towards animal feed and ultimately reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You can buy alternative vegetables, allowing minor crops um, more access on the global trade market and they can grow more sustainably in developing nations. We can shop locally and reduce our food miles. And we can grow our own. Now, if you haven't got a garden, um, you can still join in by joining a community growing group. This will improve your nutrition, your health and well-being, and improve your social circle. But most importantly, you're taking control of your own food security. And finally, encourage your children to grow. I have three boys, and this is great because it gets them out of the house, and um, it's a sneaky way to get the fruit and vegetables in. But ultimately, you're giving them a love of the environment and a responsibility of food production for years to come. So, as I mentioned earlier, I've got a slightly different background to these guys. I come from a business and marketing background. So, what my role within the group has really been is to have a look at some of these solutions and see how they can be sustainably implemented in the current economic climate. And when you ask people about this, one thing comes up over and over again, and it's the same thing. People are looking for a single technological innovation, something to come along and solve all of these problems at once. Now, hopefully, we've convinced you that this isn't likely going to be the case. And that's quite nicely summed up by this diagram from the Royal Society. Now, what it shows are three distinct disciplines, all of which need to be aligned before we can really put into place systems of sustainable agriculture. Science and technology, environmental factors. These are two things that we probably think of when addressing this problem. But it's this third category that's really interesting, social and economic factors. And what this is saying is that to create sustainable solutions to food security, we need agricultural issues to permeate every layer of our society. We need to permeate politics, consumerism, and even the everyday lifestyle choices that we make. Now, this might seem like an impossible task to create such widespread knowledge of agricultural issues, but fortunately, we as a species have a huge evolutionary advantage, and it's something that's quite fundamental to our concept of humanity, and that's our ability to share. Tens of thousands of years ago, we would communicate with each other by painting on cave walls. Hundreds of years ago, we popularised the printing press. And today, we're constantly sharing information across the internet. And this sharing of information is something that we're constantly doing and constantly expanding upon. So the question really becomes, how do we utilise this innate predisposition to overcome the challenges that food security has? And we believe the solution to this is quite simple. We need to create educational systems that inspire young people to take up careers in agriculture. There might not be a single technological innovation which solves all of these problems at once, but innovation itself is a huge factor. And even those whose lives aren't directly involved in food production will have a massive impact on the system. So 
Going back to the Royal Society's diagram for a moment, we can see that we need to create a world where even those involved in politics, business, and other socio-economic institutions make decisions related to agriculture in the same way that current financial decisions are made. We need a system which integrates agriculture into primary education worldwide and provides an expanding, not shrinking range of opportunities for further study. A system which doesn't rule out potential avenues of research, but encourages debate and discussion about controversial innovations. Genetically modified foods, crop rotation, intensive agriculture, the demand for research and graduates in these fields is there. We just need to create the supply. So what's all of this leading towards? Where do we want to be? What's the final destination of this journey in providing food security? Well, to us, it's this. Food sovereignty, a democratic discussion about our food on a local, national, and global scale. Now, it's important to understand a little distinction here. Food security refers to the access to and availability of food for all. Food sovereignty is a means of achieving this through democratic participation in issues surrounding world hunger. It's not the same as consumer choice. In fact, to be honest, it's nearly the opposite. It's about removing power from the retail elite <coughs> and distributing it evenly across the system. You can imagine the current system a bit like an hourglass, where at the top, food is produced. And then this is filtered through the retail and distribution system that consists of only a couple of major players. And it's this filtration which is shown to us at the end as consumer choice. When you imagine it like this, it becomes very easy to see where most of the power lies. Here with the retailers. What food sovereignty aims to do is remove this concentration of power and distribute it evenly across producers, retailers, and consumers. We believe it's not until we have this widespread participation and action on issues of food security that we will begin to see a real change in our world. Thank you. <laughs>